on behalf of the Institute of Peace, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this morning's discussion with a number of the founding members of the Syrian National Council and organization whose formation was announced uh, in Istanbul only about some days ago. I'm Steve Heidemann. I'm a senior advisor for the Institute on Middle East Initiatives, and we are delighted to see all of you here this morning. As I'm sure uh, this audience is aware, the Syrian opposition almost since the very start of the uprising in March has confronted a number of very significant questions, questions about its seeming fragmentation, questions about its lack of experience, questions about the difficulties it has faced in developing a unified leadership structure that would not only provide a more coherent leadership for the uprising itself, but would also help to demonstrate to the international community the viability of the Syrian opposition as an alternative to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. And now, after an extended period of challenging, and I think it's fair to say at times difficult discussions among the opposition, it has created the Syrian National Council as the unified leadership structure that the opposition has been struggling to develop for some time. The SNC was formally introduced to the world only 10 days ago. I think within that very short period of time, it has become clear that the SNC is a significant step forward for the Syrian opposition. Perhaps the best indication of that has been the response of the Syrian regime itself to the formation of the SNC. You are probably all aware that uh, Foreign Minister of Syria, Walid Mu'allim, warned the international community not to extend recognition to the Syrian National Council. And I think that speaks highly of the extent to which it views the SNC as a potential threat. At the same time, it's also clear that as a very young uh, umbrella organization working with a number of different groups within the Syrian opposition, that the SNC continues to face a number of significant challenges as it consolidates itself, both in reaching out to activists within Syria and in demonstrating its credibility and its legitimacy uh, to the international community. And so we are very pleased at the US Institute of Peace to be able to host the first opportunity for Washington audiences and for the audiences that are joining us on the web uh, and on Twitter. Uh, what would an event be if it were not webcast and tweeted? Um, to interact with a number of individuals who have played central roles in the formation of the SNC and have been deeply involved in the extended discussions among the opposition that resulted in the formation of the SNC. These are people who, even though they are working outside of Syria, have been very much on the front lines of the opposition to the Assad regime. And we're delighted to have them here with us this morning to talk with us about, and to answer your questions concerning what the SNC is about, how it sees its role, what its priorities are, and what its agenda is for the immediate future. Unfortunately, 
We hope to have with us today by Skype a prominent member or leader of the Syrian uprising, uh, an SNC member, a man who has been on the front lines, physically on the front lines of the Syrian opposition since it began, and who dedicated himself to uh, advocating for democratic change in Syria for much of the past two decades. Uh, I'm referring to Mr. Riyad Saif, whose biographical information we presented to you in the materials prepared for this meeting. As I'm sure you all know, Mr. Saif was attacked by agents of the Syrian regime last week. His arm was broken in the attack. He sustained other injuries, which fortunately are minor. However, we received credible information that if he were to participate in the event this morning, he would be placing himself at risk, uh, including the possibility of, of targeting by one of the regime's assassination squads. And so we, um, we decided with enormous respect for the difficulty of the conditions under which he works and with recognition of his commitment to political change in Syria, that it would be best if, if Riyad Saif were not uh, participating in the event uh, this morning. Before we get underway and turn the, the, uh, the panel over to our, our, our um, eminent speakers, I wanted to um, make sure you were all aware of the procedures that we're going to be following this morning. Uh, you have bio information on our speakers. Uh, there is, in addition, a packet. Uh, Osama, I believe you have a copy to show the audience. Yeah a packet with further information about the SNC that is available for you to pick up on the table outside of the room. Uh, each of our speakers will be making brief opening comments, five to 10 minutes. We want to move very quickly into the interactive uh, piece of our, of our activity this morning. After we have heard from our speakers, we're going to open the floor to questions, but we ask that you please write down the question that you would like to pose uh, to a member of the panel, that you identify which panelist you are addressing with your question or whether you would like the question to be addressed by the panel as a whole. Uh, you should have index cards for doing this. Those will be collected. They will be brought to the front of the room and filtered so that we have a chance to cluster like questions, avoid duplicates. I will do everything I can to ensure that as many of your questions as possible are addressed to the members of our panel this morning. In addition, because the event is being webcast and we are tweeting <coughs> about it as it unfolds, we invite those of you who are watching the event on the web or who are receiving tweets about the event to contact us with questions. Uh, and we will do our best to bring those to the attention of our panelists uh, as well. So without any further ado, um, let me again welcome you. And let me turn the panel over first to Naj Professor Najib Ghadban, who will provide some background on the SNC and the dynamics surrounding its formation and its next steps. Najib, please. Good morning. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for your SIP for this opportunity. Um, in my brief remarks, I would like just to uh, introduce some maybe um, uh, points about the uh, road to the formation of the Syrian National Council. Uh, I think it's, uh, I feel it's important to emphasize at the beginning that the uh, Syrian revolution is uh, situated uh, within the Arab Spring. And sometimes I think when, uh, you know, people look at Syria, they try to look at it as 
um, you know, focus on strategic stability in Syria, etc., and and kind of overlook the right of the Syrian people to be part of this movement, which demanding uh, nothing less than freedom and, and, and dignity for Syrians. Um, the second, maybe uh, introductory point, um, it, it, the, the road to forming SNC uh, really started with uh, the coming to power of Bashar al-Assad in 2000. Uh, we went through several phases, uh, the first of which was known as the Damascus Spring Movement, and um, our colleague who was supposed to be with us, Riyad Saif, was a leading figure of that movement. That movement uh, expressed itself in the desire of um, prominent Syrians inside and outside Syria, uh, basically to revive civil society, to bring political life back um, after it was frozen for, for three decades under um, Assad the father. Um, and uh, that movement, uh, you know, issued some documents. You, many of you are aware of the document of the 99, the document of the 1000, uh, which included basic demands, which are, in fact, uh, endorsed uh, right now in the SNC. Again, uh, early on, the, the document of the 99 uh, was a very basic demands of lifting emergency laws. This would be one of the first demands of the revolution to uh, release political prisoners, to uh, you know, allow exiles to go back. And then the statement of the 1000 added to that the necessity of reform, both economic and, and political. And uh, of course, that movement uh, was uh, nipped in the, in the bud uh, six months later and, and uh, uh, ended in the imprisonment of our colleague Riyad Saif. And here, since he's not with us, I'll in fact refer to him several times because uh, out of the 10 years of Bashar's rule, he spent about eight years in prison. Um, under Bashar. Uh, we move on to 2002, 2003. Again, there was a revival of those demands. Uh, this is when um, the U.S. was ready to invade Iraq. Many voices inside and outside were telling the Bashar regime to uh, reform the country. That would be the best guarantee to basically be able to withstand any external pressure. Uh, then we come to uh, October 2005, and this is the formation of something called the Damascus Declaration. And I think that, um, uh, that movement was so significant because it's finally um, stated that the only way for Syria to move forward uh, is to have comprehensive democratic change in the country. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, document received the most endorsement um, from uh, individuals, from uh, activists, from political parties, and, and it became the consensus, if you will, of the Syrian opposition. Uh, then there was uh, another um, uh, attempt at forming the um, National Salvation Front, which is, again, trying to bring together various groups into a one front. And I think the idea, and, and this is, we, we continue this, this process with the SNC uh, to emphasize that, you know, one of the maybe arguments of the regime uh, is that there is no viable alternative to the Assad regime. And I think uh, it's been always our challenge to prove the, uh, the opposite. Um, so um, we, we come to 2010. Um, things were not looking good for the Syrian opposition in 2010, and the, as they were not looking good for any, actually, of the Arab countries. It was a very dismal point. Uh, I remember I was attending a conference in Morocco about democracy and human rights in the Arab world, October uh, of 2010, and we looked around as we, you know, kind of were exchanging our experiences regarding democracy and human rights, and uh, it really looked really, really a terrible picture, I mean, for all countries. But then uh, it was the Tunisian Bouazizi who let himself on fire and, and uh, basically sparked the Arab Spring. And uh, the discussion for Syrians was, would it happen in Syria? Osama remembers, uh, I hosted a conference at my university um, on January 28, 29, uh, and um, you know, we were talking about 10 years of Bashar's rule, and one of the questions was, could it happen in Syria? When, how, and under what circumstances? Again, um, most, I think, uh, said that it's really, uh, it's difficult to, to, to happen, but I think people underestimated a lot of the undercurrents that were taking place in all of those countries, including in Syria, where uh, you know, a whole generation was born, uh, in fact, under the Assad regime, but uh, they were looking for better opportunities which the regime could not provide. I think I would come to a point um, which is significant in, the, in this process of formation, uh, the formation of SNC, and 
I would consider it like a, an, an important step. Um, it was a, what I call spontaneous phase of, of you know, individuals, of groups, trying to, to talk, uh, trying to discuss things, and um, to see like how can we prepare for something uh, like what happened in Tunisia and, and Egypt. Um, and uh, at the same time that that phase, I'm talking here January to March 15 phase, um, we were still, many of us, hoping that Bashar would take the, the actually the initiative and bring about reform to the country. Um, but he was, um, again, proving us over and over, um, you know, kind of uh, that he's not that kind of a, of a man. Uh, I refer you to uh, the interview he gave to the Wall Street Journal uh, end of January, in which he said all we could do is improve media laws, allow some NGOs, etc. That's the vision he presented. It was very frustrating, and it, I think uh, all Syria needed was a spark for, for the, the Syrian um, um, version of, of the Arab Spring, and it came in the city of Dara with the children. You know the story. So the second phase was um, many of us, uh, inside and outside, felt, especially uh, as much as we were inspired by uh, the young people who took into the street, by, by how not only actually brave they were, how, how uh, you know, kind of very um, open-minded in, in terms of emphasizing the peacefulness of the nature of the revolution, emphasizing national unity in order to deprive the regime of, of the opportunities to repress this movement, uh, yet we were shocked by the level of response on the part of the regime, uh, which was basically to open fire and kill demonstrators, peaceful demonstrators. It was extremely shocking. Um, so that, that phase, I think Syrian communities abroad, inside, tried to do something. So it was the, you know, around the, the world you see Syrians uh, demonstrating in front of, in this country, the White House, Syrian uh, embassy. I remember the first demonstration in front of the White House had 22 Syrians. Um, uh, one month later, we had 800 in front of the Syrian embassy. So uh, you see Syrians wanted to do something about, about what was happening in Syria. Then we moved to the next phase, which was the conferences phase. We had three or four conferences trying to come up with a body that represent uh, the, the Syrian um, aspirations, the, the Syrian revolution. And, and unfortunately, those conferences really could not produce what we were hoping for. Um, one thing, I mean, you know, people needed to get to know each other. I mean, Syrians were not allowed, were not giving that luxury of, of you know, meeting. I mean, you know, it's like when you, whenever you have three Syrians, uh, they suspect, you know, one of them is, is a, you know, kind of an agent for the secret service. So you, you know the, the, that culture. Um, so it really took a while to, for people to get to know each other, to exchange ideas. And I think one, one of the problems with these conferences, they did elect bodies, but it was, they, they tried to get into the idea of having more representative bodies. And, and um, so, you know, getting into the whole notion of, you know, setting quotas for this group or that particular trend and so on and so forth. Uh, it was really the third conference, uh, al Inqaz conference, on July 15, uh, that finally led us to think, we need to think in a different way to come up with, with this council. Um, the the Iqaz conference was supposed basically to take place both inside and outside Syria. The day before the conference, the Syrian uh, security forces stormed the headquarter in, 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 in the neighborhood of Damascus, killed 19, injured 200, and basically it was a message, this kind of activities is not allowed. Um, we were outside, we were shocked, and, and we, we couldn't really do much about it, but then we started to think, um, you know, Maybe we need to, to do this in, by a different way. A small group of us, we call ourselves independents, technocrats, call us whatever, decided to take the initiative and, and uh, present a simple idea that what we need now to bring um, a group of, of uh, Syrian activists uh, uh, who, in fact, would be able to um, uh, chart a roadmap for forming uh, a body which would represent the Syrian revolution. And I think this is how the process started and, and uh, kind of we had, of course, to, to uh, get in touch with the forces inside Syria, particularly the local coordinating councils, and that took three weeks, and then uh, to extend um, these consultations into, into the traditional political parties and uh, to other prominent individuals. And finally, um, we came up with uh, the formula. Uh, first, uh, it was uh, sometimes in August, we formed the core group of uh, SNC. This time, really, we, we emphasized um, qualifications and merit as the main, um, you know, kind of requirement for joining uh, SNC, but without um, over, overlooking the uh, question of rep representation. But we did not start with the representation as the main criteria for uh, inclusion. Um, as we uh, were conducting more further consultation, we had to take into account the question of representation. Uh, but um, finally, um, the, the, I think uh, the, you see more um, basic information about the SNC 
Um, uh, the, the, what I want to emphasize, and I have, what, two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll end in two minutes. A uh, couple of points. First, um, we succeeded in, in creating a balance between the inside and outside. And, and uh, from the very beginning, we, we believe that uh, any credible council must have representation, especially uh, from the coordinating uh, councils. And uh, this word for Syrians is extremely um, important. Everything is about coordination now. Um, so those are the young uh, revolutionaries, basically. Uh, secondly, um, we try to, uh, again, strike a second balance between uh, what we call the independent technocrats and the political representation, which, again, would include uh, ethnic, religious, uh, geographic representation, which I think ha we had to take into account. Uh, thirdly, we had to deal with the question of the representation of the Islamists. And uh, again, um, this time, I mean, I think uh, one of the first things that may be been said about this, Islamists are overrepresented in, in this body. Uh, based on the figures we have, and we did extensive mapping, um, uh, the first actually, uh, the core group of the 140 uh, members, I think we had even uh, percentages. And the percentage for uh, Islamists in that was 21%, if I remember. And that would even be lowered this time because other groups join, including more independent leftist liberals and uh, other forces. Um, so uh, what helped with, with, with this solving this issue, the belief of the Islamists that they are part of this uh, uh, you know, process, part of this revolution, but they're not really eager to try to uh, be the, the leading uh, maybe force uh, of this. Let me uh, end by just uh, mention that our work is still work in progress. We are very modest about you know, our <laughs> claims at this point, and I think my colleagues are going to address other aspect of this, but we realize that uh, one of the main challenges facing us, and I'll end with that one, uh, is um, after the announcement of the council, we received a very impressive uh, support inside Syria. Uh, that Friday after the announcement was called the Friday of the National Council, of the Syrian National Council. And uh, the sign was carried that this SNC represents me. Um, and as a result of that, I think it was a clear message that we are, in fact, in the process of forming a viable alternative uh, to the Assad regime. It was so serious, as Steve said, um, that the regime, in fact, recognized us and, and nicely. <laughs> and uh, we were, uh, in fact, uh, honored by, by that. But, but more seriously, I mean, uh, the, the regime is, is really uh, kind of going after the activists. I just want to mention, uh, you know, we talked about Riyadh Saif. But um, the same Friday, they assassinated one uh, member of the uh, General Sec Secretariat, uh, our colleague, Mishal Temmo, uh, who's been uh, very active uh, throughout the 10 years of Bashar's rule. Um, and again, it was a, a message how serious the regime is, is, is taking us. So our challenge, we feel that we have to deliver to those young people. We have to show them that we represent them, that we are able to uh, you know, voice their message, uh, and at the same time, um, while we are still in the process of completing the formation of SNC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Najib. You, you've touched on one issue that I, I'm sure we'll come back to again already, which is how the imperative to organize the SNC in a fashion that provides for representation of critical constituencies might introduce tensions when it comes to overcoming some of these representative groupings and building a more cohesive sense of the SNC's priorities and its agenda. I know you've been wrestling with these issues, but I, I introduce it as a question that, that we may want to come back to. Dima, please. Thank you for having us um, today here on the Institute of Peace. Um, I would like actually to start by just talking a little bit about my personal experience and how I got to be here today. And it's a very, um, it's an honor to be among my colleagues here today. Having grown up in the Assad ruled Syria, um, I was very impressed when the revolution started and just seeing people taking the streets, asking for freedom, um, freedoms that we generally take for granted and facing bullets. Um, I felt tremendous respect for them and pride in being Syrian. And I really, at many times, I wish I were in Syria alongside with them because, you know, having lived there, these are feelings that I think we all felt. Um, and as the 
the Assad regime brutally dealt with these demonstrators, killing them, torturing them, detaining them. Um, the other things that we had to deal with were some misconceptions that this was uh, a Muslim movement that minorities and certain sects weren't participating because they felt protected by the Assad regime. And among those were Christian Syrians that a lot of people in uh, Syria and outside felt were not were pro-regime, that they were not participating in the revolution. So I felt it was very important to deliver a public message that that is not true, it's a misconception. Being a Christian Syrian, uh, I felt very insulted that this would be what most people considered was the case. True that the Assad regime at some point gave a false sense of protection to certain minorities, but that was at the expense of the majority. And first and foremost, we're Syrian, and this is a human rights issue. All religion aside, we need to make sure that we focus on the human rights portion of it. So I started participating in events and speaking as um, a Christian Syrian. And in fact, we have a lot of information about Christians actually going to mosques and participate to participate in the demonstration. So it had the, the demonstration starting from mosques had nothing to do with with it being a Muslim movement. It was just a place that made sense for people to gather on Fridays, and that's why Fridays also became the days of demonstrations. So, to segue into the SNC, it it became very important to reassure all people in Syria, regardless of religion, political affiliation, um, ethnic background, that they are represented, they are Syrian first and foremost, and there will be no worries after the Assad regime is overthrown for them to be just as Syrian as everybody else. Um, and I think Najib did refer to this in terms of the formation of the SNC taking into consideration all different backgrounds in um, ensuring all the groups are represented. So that in terms of the selection of the SNC, we wanted to make sure that all the groups within Syria, regardless of their geographic location, their ethnic background, their political affiliation, um, any sectarian within even religions, like Sunnis, Alawite, Druze, they're all represented, and that was taken into account in the matrix of um, the selection criteria. So when we look today at the SNC, we have participation from all groups within Syria. There, the Kurds have representation. Um, there's seats for Assyrians, which actually is a, one of the smaller groups uh, um, within Syria. There's many Christian Syrians um, in terms of the different sects of Muslims. There, there are representatives of all different sects. And this is a continuing process. This doesn't stop here. Um, right now, the General Assembly has 230 members and the, the way the, those are divided is that 75 of them are from the interim committee that was announced back on September 15th. We have large representation of the grassroots movements, and we have several um, seats for Muslim Brotherhood, for Kurds, for independence, and we have a few that are open still for um, for people to be elected from the different groups that are still joining the SNC. We also have women representation. Um, of the, 75 core, uh, the 74 core group, there were 11 women, which is about 15%. And um, in term, the demographic is, uh, in terms of the age, the experience um, in Syria, abroad, is, is very inclusive and um, is all taken um, into consideration. The amount of activism 
was also a factor in selecting the SNC members. The important thing at this point is for all Syrians to feel represented by this council, and we believe that the matrix that we used had taken care of that. And this was evident, as uh, Najib, I think, mentioned, is that the Friday after the SNC was announced, there, the demonstrations were overwhelmingly supportive of the SNC um, in all areas, in all regions in Syria. And actually, for I think for the first time we had, uh, we, the, the Kurds in the Northeast were mobilized also, uh, and they came out in large numbers as well, um, especially after uh, Mashal Tammo was also assassinated. They felt that they also were not protected by the regime, and they are very much so part of this revolution. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, the diversity, we feel we, we're very representative of all segments of the Syrian society, and we are continuing the, that work. Um, it's, it's an ongoing process, and we hope to uh, one day have every Syrian feel represented by the SNC to make the transition to a post-Assad Syria a very smooth one and supported by everyone. Dima, thank you very much also. You, you've singled out what could be one of the critical factors in determining the fate of the SNC, and that is the extent to which minorities in Syria perceive that they themselves have a viable future in a post-Assad Syria. And it will be interesting to hear your sense and the sense of our, 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 our colleagues on the panel <coughs> about how the, uh, the rise of an armed resistance affects this challenge on the part of the opposition? What new kinds of, of concerns might it create about the possibilities for creating an inclusive, pluralist opposition that is seen by minorities as offering them a better future uh, alongside of their, their Sunni uh, f fellow Syrians? Um, Murhaf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is an important day in the young history of the SNC. Thank you for hosting us. Um, uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. There are a million things to say about the Syrian revolution. I'm trying to, I will try to contain myself to only seven uh, points that I feel are uh, strategic. I agree completely with Najib, the Syrian revolution has to be viewed within the Arab context, the context of the Arab Spring. The Syrian revolution is cross-national. It is non-sectarian. It is non-ethnic. It is a revolution against 48 years of single party rule, against 41 years of family rule. Point one. The bloodletting that has taken place in Syria and that it continues to take place could have been avoided. I take, for example, the case of Dara. Initially, as you remember, there were teenagers that had been caught writing graffiti on the wall. They were arrested. Their fathers came to extricate them the following day uh, from the hands of the cousin of Bashar al-Assad, the head of security there. Um, and they were told to go make other kids. And if they were not men enough to make other kids, to bring their wives to the Mukhabara so they could make kids for them. I'll give you another example, the March 30 parliament speech of Bashar al-Assad, where everyone was expecting really that he offer a package of reforms to put this behind. Uh, and all he could do was to blame this crisis on a foreign conspiracy. So had he handled this situation well, there would not have been a tragedy. And this goes to show that the uprising is more a product of Assad's mismanagement than it is a foreign conspiracy, which leads me to point two. The Assad regime's narrative that this is a foreign conspiracy is, to my mind, an insult to human intelligence. Assad wants people to think, certainly domestically, 
that the aim of this alleged foreign conspiracy is to break Syria's resistance to Israel's hegemonic ambitions. He claims that foreign powers, including the US, are in cahoots with Salafist gangsters who are shooting at both protesters and security forces alike. Of course, these foreign powers are in cahoots with Amnesty International and with Human Rights Watch and with the UN Human Rights Commission and with Al Jazeera and with Al Arabiya and with the International Red Cross, and I could go on and on. But of course, that argument, his argument, does not explain why soldiers are defecting daily. It does not explain why anti-regime demonstrations are ruthlessly crushed while those supportive of him uh, are not, why sharpshooters atop buildings uh, snipe at protesters at, and not at regime supporters, why private hospitals are prohibited from taking uh, the wounded uh, to treat them and instead have to transfer them to public hospitals where, although they are wounded, they are arrested and detained. This foreign conspiracy uh, argument is laughable. Uh, even those in the resistance camp, including, mind you, Iran and Hezbollah, have called on Assad to meet popular demands. Point three, the Assad regime is unwilling to institute reforms. Significant reforms would cause the Assad regime to collapse. And I totally identify with a very recent secret survey that was conducted by uh, Professor Angela Hawken of Pepperdine University, a survey that was conducted in Syria, how she managed to do this, I will never know, but in which she finds that eight out of 10 Syrians surveyed want to see regime change and won't be satisfied with mere reform. Point four, the Assad regime is unwilling to share power. In Assad's proposed political reforms, there are going to be political parties, that will need to register in view of competing for parliamentary seats in uh, February 2012. What Assad does not tell us is that these political parties need to have the consent of the Minister of the Interior in order to establish. What he doesn't tell us about the media laws is that media has to have the consent of the Information Minister in order to publish or to disseminate and any criticism of the government is penalized, a fine of $25,000. What he doesn't tell us is that Article 8 of the Constitution, which makes of the Ba'ath Party uh, superior to any political force and dominant of any political force in Syria, will not be abrogated. Here, the Assistant Secretary General, Khaitan, uh, was courageous enough to come out and say it will not be abrogated. And what Assad does not tell us is that he has the very firm intention and determination of running for president again uh, in 2014, and in a, uh, he will be the only candidate, and he will win by 99 plus percent. Um, you know, these so-called reforms, I think, are an accurate reflection of regime thinking. It is the continued regime hegemony that it wants over Syrian society. And this, the Syrian street has spoken to. Number five, the Assad regime will collapse. There is too much blood. The distance between regime and society is far too wide. The security forces are beginning to show signs of erosion other than the emergence of a free Syria army. Uh, the defense minister, as you know, General Ali Habib, was replaced for quote-unquote health reasons. And shortly thereafter, the deputy chief of staff, General Antakyali, died of a quote-unquote heart attack. I don't believe it. But my disbelief or my non-belief is I understand not evidence enough. And I think if in the end, uh, the military or units of the military do not topple the regime, it is going to be the crumbling economy that will. As you know, uh, Sur uh, Syria has lost uh, its tourism income, which was roughly a quarter uh, of its entire income. Uh, with uh, sanctions on oil, it has lost a third of its income. 
uh, and so uh, that is making uh, uh, the economy truly uh, uh, suffer, and I think it will tumble fairly soon. Six, the Assad family will not go away easily. The Assads are of the view that Syria is their family farm and that Syrians are their cattle. Rami Makhlouf, the corrupt cousin, makes this point very bluntly in a recent New York Times interview in which he says, do not expect us to sail on a boat and to go away. To survive, the Assad regime, of course, is attempting to push society to sectarian strife. It is scaring minorities into thinking that they are doomed if it's not for Assad. And simultaneously, the security forces are resorting to bestial brutality against the population so as to force uh, the militarization of the revolution. The Assad regime would like nothing better than to battle an armed force that the security forces can then sweep away. Seven, as a result of all the above, Syria may be moving towards civil war with very grave consequences, not only for Syria and Syrians, but for the entire region. And so it is incumbent upon the free world to assist the Syrian National Council in getting rid of this regime, not through military intervention, but at least by cutting the cash flow to the regime with which it finances the security forces that are brutally brutalizing the population, and by staring the Assad regime down into at least allowing international monitors uh, to act as a buffer and as a deterrent to the security forces. The Syrian National Council proposes the establishment, as Dima said, of a civil democratic government in which Syrian citizens are equal before the law. No clan and no sect is responsible for Assad's misdeeds. And finally, what is happening in the Arab world in general and in Syria in particular, is historic. The winds of freedom and democracy are sweeping across the entire region. The barrier of fear has broken. Do not let the cause of freedom down. Do not let the Syrian people down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morha. You raise a very, a very, very important point. You identified as laughable the uh, narrative of the regime about the role of the international community and international conspiracies as forces behind the Syrian uprising. And yet this narrative has had an effect on debates among Syrians about what the international community might do to assist the Syrian uprising. And it is precisely this question of the role of the international community that our final speaker, Mr. Osama Munajid, will be addressing uh, in his comments this morning. Osama. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, SIP. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine this. Imagine a new Syria, a democratic country where the universal human rights of all Syrians are respected without any discrimination. Imagine a country where Sunni Muslims, Alawites, Christians, Kurds, and all other ethnic and religious groups share a life of freedom, dignity, and equality. A country where political pluralism mirrors Syria's rich, rich cultural diversity. Imagine a Syria where civil society exercises its rights to actively participate in shaping up national development policies. Imagine a country where freedom of speech unleashes the long suppressed creativity and entrepreneurships of the Syrian people. Imagine a new Syria governed by the rule of law and an active and obliging member of the international community committed to contributing to peace and stability in the Middle East and respectful of all nations and international agreements. This is the Syria that the Syrians imagine. This is the Syrian dream. For Syrians have dreams too. And we, all, we are all too aware that 
This dream of freedom is priceless and has a cost, which we Syrians are prepared to pay to fulfill our aspirations and bring forth our dreams. But for this dream to come true, we need, to support, we need the support of the international community. We need your support. We now stand seven months into the revolution against the Assad regime. The atrocities committed so far are beyond the wildest imagination of most. Thanks to the coordinating committees and the youth groups on the ground who feed us with daily updates, document the atrocities and continue to do all the groundwork against all odds. We know that more than 4,000 unarmed civilians have been killed, including over 400 women and children. There are more than 45,000 people imprisoned. You have heard of and seen the mutilated bodies. You have also heard eyewitnesses, uh, eyewitness accounts of torture, not only of the activists themselves, but also their families and relatives and loved ones. The amount of grief and sorrow is unimaginable. The country is anguished with missing husbands, raped daughters, humiliated elders, and dead sons. The crimes being committed against the Syrian people by this mafia regime are sickening. If things continue as they are, and nothing changes, with a fast-forward snapshot into the future a year or two from now, what can we expect to happen if the international community remains silent? How many more human rights violations can we expect? How many more deaths, tortures, and how will we, or you, as members of the international community, feel if we take no action? Can our collective con um, consciousness take on another hammer of 1982? The Syrian people have, avoid, uh, has, have, have voiced their wishes. al shab yurid isqat and nidan People demand the fall of the regime. And so you have heard from, many, from my colleagues, uh, we now have a unified and organized opposition, the Syrian National Council with whom the international community can engage with as, as a legitimate body representing the vast, vast majority of the opposition groups who will act on behalf of the people, having been legitimized by the people in Syria to work towards meeting their demands until the Assad regime topples and free and fair elections are held. What is the responsibility of the international community today? What can the international community do to assist the Syrian people and the Syrian National Council now? We need fast action from our friends, close and far. From our neighbors, Turkey and the Arab countries, we need immediately an official recognition of the Syrian National Council as the sole representative of the Syrian opposition and as a legitimate representative of the Syrian people. This will provide the Syrian opposition with the morale backing and political recognition and support that it needs. By knowing that key, uh, knowing that they have a legitimate representative speaking on their behalf, the morale and revolutionary stamina of the Syrian youth who are risking their lives on a daily basis will be significantly enhanced. We need the international community to cut all communications with the Assad regime, and I'm specifically referring to regional here, and regional powers in Turkey, to cut all communications with the Assad regime, to isolate it from the rest of the world, and to make it clear to the regime that nobody condones, implicitly or explicitly, its violent repression of the peaceful uprising. Withdrawal of their ambassadors from Damascus to delegitimize the regime and to, st to send a clear signal that these governments, regional and the Gulf and Turkey, will not tolerate the current barbaric behavior of the Assad regime. This will encourage other governments in the region and elsewhere to take similar actions that will lead to the complete diplomatic isolation of the regime. Freezing the membership of the Syrian government in the Arab League 
and halting the activities of all the specialized agencies of the Arab League in Syria. Ban Syrian satellite TV, state satellite TV, as well as private TV channels funded by the regime from broadcasting um, using Arab satellites such as ArabSat or NileSat. This will reduce the influence of the Assad regime's propaganda among Syrian communities in the diaspora and undermine the regime's remaining support among these communities. Impose economic sanctions similar to those imposed by uh, the EU and the US to, delete, to, to deplete the financial resources of the regime and help undermine the support of the business community. Freeze the assets of all Syrian officials directly or indirectly involved in the violent repression of the uprising or in the financing of the regime. And kick regime business agents out of their countries. This will send a clear signal to Assad that, and his uh, cronies that they will not be allowed to use these countries to launder their fortunes or to hide the stolen wealth of the Syrian people. What is, needed, what is needed from Europe and the United States? Again, recognize the Syrian National Council as the legitimate representative of the Syrian people. And as the only feasible and legitimate alternative to fill the political vacuum during the transitional period following the downfall of the Assad regime. The regime and its apologists can no longer hide behind the threat of civil war, political chaos, or a takeover by Muslim extremists as an excuse for the continued survival of the Assad Mafia regime. Cut all political and economic ties with the regime to ensure its international isolation and to encourage all other countries to follow suit. Set up these sanctions on all individuals and businesses involved in financing the regime, not only Syrians, but Arabs and other nationalities alike. Impose strict sanctions on the oil sector, not only oil exports, but also all related upstream activities. Oil revenues contribute about a third of the Syrian government's budget, and the sanctions will dry up this important source of funding of the Syrian repression machine. Consider alternative options outside the mandate of the United Nations to isolate the Assad regime, and this could include collaborations between OECD, the Gulf, uh, GCC, GCC countries, to impose and enforce economic sanctions. Show your clear support to the SNC, including meetings of high-level officials with SNC representatives. This will have tremendous positive effect on the morale of the Syrian people and would encourage greater media exposure and coverage of the situation in Syria. While we greatly appreciate the efforts of the United States and the European Union to assist a UN Security Council resolution to condemn the Syrian regime, we are understandably very disappointed with the recent veto by Russia and China. However, some United UN Security Council members chose to accept the narrative of the Assad regime by blaming the violence on armed terrorists and Muslim extremists. Then the US and EU should push for a new UN Security Council resolution to send UN monitoring mission to Syria. If the Syrian regime allowed such missions, the regime will certainly lose. If they do not, they will equally lose. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe in the moral and diplomatic power of the international community and in its ability to take action to help us topple the Assad regime and bring down one of the last vestiges of, of, of extreme totalitarianism in the world. The international community has done so before and we implore it, we implore it to act again to fulfill its international responsibility. Edmund Burke once said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. As good men and women, we all have responsibility towards Syria and to make the Syrian dream come true. Because Syrian's dream is your dream as well. Together, we can make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Osama, very much.